Hey, we are continuing our Heroes series, and we're looking in Acts chapter 4 today at, uh, at a hero that I think you can relate to. Because I don't know about you, but we've been in this hero series for a while, and we've been looking at these people that are amazing, but sometimes it's just kind of difficult to relate to them, uh, you know, in a, in a real-life way. I mean, they're real people, and they did real cool stuff, and we learn from their acts of faith, but honestly, we kind of know God's not going to call us to fight a giant. Uh, or, you know, to walk on water or to uh, lead a suicide mission of 300 men against 135,000 uh, in a military operation. That's probably not in our scope. And so we learn from them, but we can't really relate to them. And, and if that's the case for you, then today we're going to be looking at a hero that you can completely relate to. Uh, because he's kind of uh, our boring hero. I don't, I don't know how else to put it. I mean, he, he just... He does ordinary stuff, and everything that he did, we can do. Everything he did, we can participate in. And, and we're talking about a guy called Barnabas. And you can call him Barnabas the Boring if you want, if that helps you remember who he is. Uh, but he wasn't really boring at all. He was, he was an incredible guy. Uh, in fact, if he were around today, we would, we would really love him. And you would want him to hang out with you because of the kind of person that he is. So Acts chapter 4, verse 32, is where his story picks up. Now, let me just set the stage. That this is in the early days of the church. You know, Jesus has ascended. He's gone back to heaven. He told the disciples to wait in Jerusalem. The Holy Spirit came upon them, and the church was born in a dramatic fashion. 3,000 people that first day. It happened, in, and this is probably in the first months, the first year of the church. And, and all these people are there in Jerusalem. And it says this, beginning in verse 32. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to each as, in, as any had need. Thus Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now Barnabas did two ordinary things that made him a hero. And if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins. You believe that he was raised from the dead. And you've made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life. Then God is calling you to be a hero. And you can do these two ordinary things and be a hero also. So what were these two things? First of all, Barnabas was generous. Barnabas was generous. Did you notice this in verse 36? It said, uh, Joseph, who was called by the apostles Barnabas, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Barnabas was a generous man. Now, here's the setting. The early church was a very close community, and part of that was necessity, and part of that was culture. You see, the, the early believers in Jesus uh, there at, in Jerusalem were, uh, well, some of them lived in Jerusalem, but a lot of them had traveled to Jerusalem for a festival. Festival of Booths is what it's called. That coincides with Pentecost. And so there were thousands of people in Jerusalem who were from other places. And a lot of them became believers in Jesus. And, and their life was transformed. And they were learning from the apostles. And they didn't want to go home. They wanted to stay there and, and just soak it in. And, and so uh, they were travelers. They were living out of suitcases. They didn't have jobs. They didn't have houses. They didn't have uh, material goods. And so people were taking them into their homes. They were sharing together what they had. And basically, they needed resources to feed people, to take care of the church. And, and in that moment of need, Barnabas set the example. He set the example of what generosity looked like. Uh, so people were being generous, and Barnabas was kind of the pace setter. And we know he's the pace setter because he's the only one named in Scripture. And, and we don't know why he's the only one named, because it said as many as owned houses and lands sold them and brought the money to the apostles, and this one guy named Barnabas did it. And, and so God recognized Barnabas' generosity by naming him in Scripture. It's kind of a big deal. Now, maybe he was the first one to do it. 
Maybe he set the pace and he was like, hey, I'm going to go do this. And so he's recognized because he was the first. Maybe his gift was crazy big. We don't know. Uh, we don't know the why. We just know that he was set apart by God to be recognized for his generosity. So as a church, Calvary tries to set the example when it comes to generosity. We give away over 20% of our budgeted dollars to missions from Lake Havasu City to the ends of the earth. Uh, last year, in our last uh, budget year, we gave away over $375,000 to mission causes. That's what you guys gave. Okay? Yeah, pretty cool, isn't it? And that does not even include the benevolence offering like the one we'll take up today because all of that, thousands of dollars every year, goes to help the needy in our community. You know, from everything from paying the electric bill to, to fixing their car to just giving them groceries. And, and your generosity in that allows us uh, multiple times during the year just to give away gift cards and bless people. Like next week when we're going to give away Staples cards to bless teachers. That's because of your generosity. And, and so we're trying to set the example. And, and as, a, as a Southern Baptist church, uh, we actually lead all Southern Baptist churches in Arizona in our cooperative giving. See, what you don't know, may, may not know is uh, Southern Baptist, there's like over 40,000 churches across the country, and we pool our money to support, you know, 8,000 missionaries and six seminaries and, and all this kind of work that's going on. And out of all the churches in Arizona, Calvary is the one that sets the pace. Uh, you know, yeah, celebrate that because we're, what we're trying to do is, is challenge churches to increase their generosity, to share more of what God has given them because generosity unleashes ministry. Generosity unleashes ministry. Look at verse 33. It says, And with great power the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Now, you could just pluck that verse out of that spot and put it in almost any place in the New Testament, and it would be like, great, that's awesome. But it's found in the middle of a passage about generosity. The early church, people were sharing what they had. They were taking care of their neighbors. They were feeding the hungry. And, and these stories of generosity, and it's all wrapped up because generosity unleashes ministry. Now, obviously, you've got to have resources to do ministry. That's just kind of a no-brainer. But beyond obvious, what you may not see is that God delights when his children give in the manner that he gives. I mean, after all, when we embrace Jesus, we become sons and daughters of God. And God is a giving God. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. You see, God is a giving God. He loves to be generous. And when he sees his kids modeling his character, his heart, his passion to be generous, guess what happens? God shows up. God shows up in a powerful way, and we see that happening in the early church. We see that happening here. As Calvary has increased our generosity in our community, our influence and impact have grown. And you see it in so many ways. When more people show up for church, we got more decisions to follow Christ, more people getting baptized, more people serving the community. That, I think those, those are connected. And so let me just take a moment and say this. Thank you, Calvary family, for being generous. Thank you for loving Lake Havasu. Thank you for loving Jesus. Thank you for putting your, your dollars where your mouth is. Because I love leading a generous church. And you guys are a generous congregation. So thank you. It's a privilege. And I want to acknowledge that because of your generosity, ministry is happening in the name of Christ. <clears throat> so generosity unleashes ministry. And then we see in Barnabas that God gives resources to people to fund his kingdom's work. Uh, God expects all of his followers to be generous. Okay, I, if, if you are new to the faith and you're just following Jesus, this may be a surprise to you, but God actually expects all of his children to be generous. Specifically, in Scripture, it spells out a tithe. Ten percent of our income, God expects us to give back to him. Now, there's two reasons for that. The first one is, um, it's our way of saying, God, we recognize that you're the one who gives us everything, and uh, so we're going to trust you and honor you by giving you back 10%. Because you've asked for it, we're going to give it to you, because we believe that you're going to provide for us enough to take care of us. And so it's a statement of faith and gratitude to God. Secondly, it's equal. 10% is 10%, whether you're talking about a dollar or a million. doesn't matter. 
it's 10%. And so it's equal. It, it makes the, the field equal. All of us can be obedient and generous in the sight of God because if we give our 10% on, based on our income, hey, if your income is zero, how much is 10% of zero? Zero. You can be faithful. We, even if you have no income, you can be faithful. But if your income is $100, in God's eyes, 10% of $100 is equal to 10% of a million dollars. I mean, you know, we act differently when somebody shows up with that, but God doesn't. He sees it for what it is, obedient generosity. And by the way, 10% is the beginning point of generosity in the kingdom of God. But everyone in the early church didn't have property to sell and donate. If you noticed in the text, it said, for those who had, for as many who had houses and lands, <clears throat> they did this. So some had property and sold it and gave it to the apostles for ministry. <clears throat> and here's what I want us to see. God blesses some with abundant resources so they can fund ministry in extraordinary ways, way beyond the 10%. Uh, Bill Hybels, who is the founder of Willow Creek Community Church outside of Chicago that was like the first megachurch in America, he, he says this, God gifts some people with the ability to make money, not so they can indulge themselves, but so they can give it away to expand God's kingdom. He calls that the gift of generosity. And, and, and here's the thing, you guys know who you are. Some of you in this room have a God-given ability to make money. Everything you do, everything you touch turns to gold. You just, you just have that gift, and you think, you just think you're extra brilliant, and actually you're just extra gifted. There's a lot of people in this room that wish they had that gift. Are you going to give me water? It's not, the, it's not dry, it's just there's a frog living right there. <laughs> and I can't get the booger out, he's been bothering me all morning long. But since he brought the water, I'm going to drink it. And this is awkward, taking a drink in front of, you know, hundreds of people, watching you do that, see if you're going to spill or anything. But thank you. Uh, the, uh, wait, you were not applauding me drinking water, were you? Because that is just so wrong. Uh, <clears throat> so, so here's the thing. Some of you are like, hey, you know what? Uh, you've got this gift of making money. Others of you are envious of the people who do. You know, I, I can relate to that because we have the gift of spending money, not making it. And, uh, but here's the deal. God didn't just gift you that way so you can indulge you. He gifted you that way for a purpose so that you can do extraordinary things for his kingdom's work. Uh, so God is calling everyone in this room to be a faithful, generous giver, to be a hero that way. But God is calling some in this room to be heroes of generosity, to do extraordinary things. Like, uh, I have no doubt there's somebody in this room that could write a check and pay off the $2.9 million debt we have on Sweetwater Building. I, you just could do that. And, and there's some of you in this room that could write a check and fund new expansion that I believe God's going to have us do uh, in uh, the, you know, Bullhead City area and the Parker area. You know, I, I just feel like every time I drive through those areas that God's saying, hey, you know, they need a healthy church here that, that has a lot of the values that you have, and, and we're going to do that one day in God's timing and in God's placement. Uh, but uh, when we do that, it's going to cost money to launch new campuses. And, and there's some of you that could fund that ministry. That there's some of you that, that have the kind of resources that you can make a life-changing impact for generations. And here's the cool thing. Some of you already have. Some of you already have. Uh, last year when we, uh, we talked about going to Mozambique and, and Calvary said we're going to donate a well, drill one well. Uh, and, and we invited you to give. There was a family that came up and said, hey, we want to sponsor three wells uh, in, in Mozambique. And I was like, great, that's awesome. I wrote this sermon, and after I wrote the sermon, about a week later, another family came and said, hey, we're going to do five wells in Mozambique. Put a check in my hand. Yeah, see, that's, that's being heroes of generosity because that's going to affect thousands of people that will never meet this side of eternity, but who need clean water and who need the water of life. Uh, that's being a hero. Uh, someone uh, in, our, in our church made a donation to fund kids' scholarships to camp. And they gave us enough uh, of a donation to fund 70 scholarships to camp. Yeah, isn't that cool? And uh, see, I, I celebrate that too. And, 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 but here's the wild thing. Uh, we sent 215 kids to camps this summer. And so God is working at that. So some of you are going, oh, hey, they sponsored 70. I don't have to give to the scholarships. We can still use your, your, uh, your help that way. And, and then uh, 
one lady who was a part of Calvary for years and years and years uh, recently went home to be with the Lord. She left her house to Calvary. Uh, and, uh, and so we're in the process of uh, getting ready to market that and be able to take those proceeds and invest them back into ministry. And, and then years ago, about uh, five, six years ago, we had somebody give us the single biggest gift we've ever received as a ministry. Uh, they actually went out and sold property, and, and out of that they gave a gift to Calvary of $450,000. And that's what we use to pay off, finish paying off the Sweetwater property and get launched into our building program that's resulted in today. And here's the crazy thing. The person who gave that gift wasn't even a member. You see, yeah, go ahead and, go ahead and celebrate. <laughs> Generosity is heroic. And, and, and like I said, God expects all of his children to be faithful and obedient and generous. But Barnabas was a hero of generosity, and God is calling some of you to be heroes of generosity. So we see that Barnabas was generous. That's one of the ways he was heroic. And secondly, Barnabas was encouraging. He was encouraging. Look again at verse 36. Thus Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. So his real name was Joseph. Barnabas was a nickname, and his nickname was Son of Encouragement. Think about how cool that is, because a lot of us have been called Sons of Something. Okay? I'm guessing it wasn't encouragement in, uh, in your case, or in mine either. Uh, and, and it, but it was more than a nickname. It was a lifestyle for Barnabas. It's what he did. It's how he lived. And we see this in his life. First of all, uh, he recruited Paul to help him in Antioch. Um, if you're not familiar with the story, turn over to chapter 11. I want to read uh, just a, a real brief passage here, uh, beginning at verse 19. What happened is this. The church is, is in Jerusalem, and everybody who was saved pretty much was in Jerusalem. And, and they were staying together and hanging out together. They kind of missed that whole part about going to the ends of the earth. Uh, and so what God allowed to happen was a great persecution happened in the early church. And it was led by this guy named Saul, who was a Pharisee, who just hated everything about Christianity. He, was, he, he f felt like Christianity was a perversion of Judaism. And, uh, and so he started having people executed. He started throwing them in prison, destroying lives. And, and God scattered the church. And in fact, this uh, same Saul decided he was going to go to another city, to Damascus, and persecute Christians there. And on the way, Jesus interrupted his life and changed his life. If you want to read that story, it's chapter 9 of Acts. Great story. And, and, and so Saul now stops being a persecutor of the church and starts being a proclaimer of Jesus. And he goes back to Jerusalem, and he's all excited, and he wants to, to you know, help the apostles, and his former friends want to kill him. And so the apostles send him home, back to where he's from, a place called Tarsus, where he waits for more than a dozen years for something to happen. And then we pick up the story where something happened. Verse 19, Acts 11. It says, Now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists. That's Greek-speaking people. That's the non-Jews. Also preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. The report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad, and he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And a great many people were added to the Lord. So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. And for a whole year they met with the church and taught a great many people. And in Antioch the disciples were first called Christians. So Barnabas decided that he was going to go get this former persecutor of the church who now is a believer and bring him to Antioch and have him help grow the ministry in this place where the gospel is exploding. Saul, who we know is the Apostle Paul, was forgotten. He was overlooked. He was marginalized. And Barnabas saw the potential for good in him. He saw that potential. And so he went and encouraged Paul to use his gifts and his training for Christ. 
And if you don't know the rest of the story, it goes like this. The, that, that Paul became Paul the Apostle, who was the greatest missionary of the first century, if not of all time, and who God used to write half the New Testament. That's what difference an encourager made in the life of Paul. And Barnabas was that hero of encouragement who said, I believe that this former persecutor, this guy who tortured Christians and had them killed, could be used by God. And so Barnabas was responsible as chief encourager to the Apostle Paul. So let me ask you this question. In your life, do you focus on affirmation or condemnation? Do you see the potential for success in others, or do you just see, simply see their flaws and their failures? Parents, grandparents, do you only notice the mistakes that your children make, or do you celebrate when they do well? You see, all of us have influence. And I know there's some of you right now who are sitting here going, I don't have any influence, it's no big deal. Every single one of us has more influence than we realize. How many of you have ever stood... At, at, on the edge of a pond and and tossed a rock into the water anybody ever done that besides me okay thank you so you know what i'm talking about when you throw the rock into the water i don't care if it's a big boulder or if it's a pebble uh besides sinking to the bottom what does it do that's right there's a ripple effect which is really cool when the water is still and you throw it in there and you can watch that ripple effect go all the way across the pond your life is a ripple effect and the, the impact of your life goes far beyond what you see, what you know, what you realize. And your words matter. The, the, the attitude that you live with matters. The encouragement or discouragement that you bring to bear matters. So are you encouraging or are you discouraging those around you? Are you encouraging them to follow God or to fall away from God? Are you encouraging them to live out their passions? Or are you just telling them what a failure they're going to be? You see, you've got influence. And we see that Barnabas was an encourager because he went and recruited Paul. And we also see that Barnabas was an encourager because he gave John Mark a second chance. Flip over a couple more chapters to Acts 15. I'm going to look at the very end of that chapter in just a moment. Again, let me tell you what happens between 11 and 15. Barnabas and Paul are called by the Holy Spirit and sent out by the church in Antioch to go on the very first missionary journey. And they have an incredible journey. They have success everywhere they go. People are saved. Churches are started. They, they just do this wonderful thing. And they took with them, you know, obviously some people, but one of them was this guy named John Mark. And, and about a third of the way into the trip, he got homesick. He was a young man, and he went home. He bailed on him. And, uh, and so they come to the, this, they come back from the trip, and they're all excited because most of the people who, who trusted Christ were Greeks, they were non-Jews. And, and then they went to Jerusalem because there were some people in the church who felt like uh, for you to accept Jesus, you had to become a Jew first. And, and Barnabas and Paul thought, now nah, you just need Jesus. And so they came to the apostles, and, and they both of them kind of had a court case, and they pled their case. If you're going to read it, it's Acts 15. And, and, uh, and the apostles said, nope, all you need is Jesus. It's just Jesus, nothing else. You don't have to become a Jew. You don't have to do anything else. It's just you trust Jesus and you have eternal life. And so then uh, the story picks up, verse 36, Acts 15. And after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us return and visit the brothers in every city where we pro proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are. Now Barnabas wanted to take with them John called Mark. But Paul thought best not to take with them one who had withdrawn from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. And there arose a sharp disagreement, so they separated from each other. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and departed, having been commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. Barnabas gave John Mark a second chance, but Paul didn't want to. Paul said, look, I, I, I don't want to take the quitter with us. He's a baby. He got homesick, whatever. I, I don't want him there. He bailed on us. Uh, I, I don't want that kind of attitude on my team. We're not taking John Mark. Barnabas says everybody deserves a second chance. We're going to take John Mark. They couldn't agree. They split up. Both continued serving God, but they split up. Now, here's the thing. Historically, we know that Barnabas was right and Paul was wrong. Barnabas was right. You know how we know Barnabas was right? Hey, do you guys know the names of the four Gospels? Matthew... Mark, Luke and John, guess who wrote Mark? You guys are going, Mark? 
Yeah. John Mark, the quitter. The guy that Paul wouldn't take with him on his journey. God used to write one of the Gospels telling the story of Jesus' birth and death and resurrection. Uh, the second reason we know that Barnabas was correct is from the Apostle Paul. Because in one of his last letters, he's writing from uh, Rome, he's in jail, and in 2 Timothy 4.11, he says, Send Mark to me, for he is very useful to me in ministry. Send him to me. Hey, remember that boy that quit, that I wouldn't take on the missionary journey? He's useful to me for ministry. Send him to me. See, the truth is we all need a second chance. We all need second chances. Every one of us has screwed up. We've failed. We've quit. We've blown it. And we all need the grace of God and that wonderful second chance. And thankfully, we serve a God of endless second chances. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and God is righteous to forgive us our sins and to purify us of all unrighteousness. What an amazing promise from God. His grace is enough for us. So it doesn't matter where you are, how you've messed up, how you've blown it, how you've failed. God's second chance is waiting for you. And I praise God for his second chances. Calvary is a church full of people who are enjoying God's second chances. Some, some of us are on our like 27th second chance. Uh, but that's okay. We serve a God of second chances. Barnabas was a second chance kind of guy. Are you? Are you a champion of forgiveness? Do you always remind people that we serve a God that redeems from our deepest brokenness? Are you someone who wants to kick people to the curb or offer grace in a second chance? You see, Barnabas was a heroic encourager. And every one of us could use a Barnabas. Every one of us could use a Barnabas. And every one of us can be a Barnabas. We can be encouragers. If our words bless, if our words build up, if our words encourage, if our words affirm, then we are going to be the hero in somebody's life. We're going to be the encouragers that get them through, that help them make it, that, that give them that second chance if we decide that we're going to use the, the God-given ability we have to speak to live, to bless, to encourage in a way that honors God, it will be life transforming. But we got to make that choice. Barnabas made that choice over and over and over and over again. And so we have the capacity to be heroic for Christ. Barnabas was a hero. He showed us what it is to be kind of an ordinary, mundane hero, but still a hero. So let me close with two questions. First one, does God consider you to be generous? Does God consider you to be generous? Here's the thing. It doesn't matter if you consider you to be generous. It doesn't matter if I consider you to be generous. What matters is, does God consider you to be generous? And if you're not sure, ask him. Ask him. Pray. Say, God. Is my generosity where you want it? And, and, and read scripture. Find out what the Bible says about generosity. Get a, you know, look up the word generous. Look up the word giving. You do whatever you need to do. But you and God have that conversation because every one of us is going to have to answer to God whether or not he considers us generous. Second question. Do the people in your life consider you an encourager? If you're not sure, I dare you to ask them. Ask them. Now you have to tell them that it's okay for them to be honest and say things you don't want to hear. But do the people around you that you're pouring your life into, that you're influencing day in and day out, your family, your friends, your coworkers, do they consider you an encourager or would they consider you something else? You see, if you want to be heroic, you got to be able to answer yes to both those questions. And every one of us can be heroes if we choose to be. Will you pray with me?